Ever had a prank go too far and make you question your entire relationship? That's what happened to me when my girlfriend, Nicole, pulled a knife prank, knowing my traumatic past with them. I lost it, and we had a massive fight. After some time apart and attempts to patch things up, I realized it wasn't just the prank. Nicole's behavior was a pattern of manipulation and control. I tried to leave, but the cycle of fear, guilt and her sweet moments kept pulling me back. Now, three years later, I'm still dealing with the aftermath, trying to rebuild my life and heal from the abuse. Was I the asshole for yelling at and ignoring her over that prank, or was it the wake-up call I needed? Here's my story. I have a story to share about an incident involving my girlfriend and a knife prank. To provide some context, over a decade ago, my family experienced a traumatic home invasion, which resulted in the loss of my mother and our dog. This event left me with a lifelong fear of knives, as well as anxiety related to blood and break-ins. Following the invasion, I developed triggers associated with specific sensory experiences, such as my mother's perfume, the sound of glass shattering and certain songs. Even now, some of these triggers still affect me, although I have made progress in managing them. I underwent extensive therapy to process the trauma, which took years of dedicated treatment, including inpatient care and medication to help with nightmares, PTSD, depression and anxiety. Ultimately, we sold the house and I moved to a different state. With continued therapy and medication, my aversion to knives became a manageable aspect of my life. I was cautious in the kitchen, but otherwise, it did not significantly impact my day-to-day -day routines. At that time, things were looking up for me, I was making new friends, managing work and school, and had recently met my first long-term adult girlfriend. Despite later realizing that we were still in the early infatuation phase, we weathered highs and lows of the relationship, and found comfort in the mundane moments. I believed that this ability to endure the regular ups and downs was a sign of a solid, stable relationship. We went on a few trips together, driving across state lines to meet her family or flying back to see my dad. On one of our trips, we went camping, and my fear of knives was brought up. That led to the break in getting brought up. She seemed to care at the time, even promising to protect me if something ever happened and offering to help install a camera in my apartment. After the camping trip, I don't know if it was always there and I noticed it more afterward or what, but she started to be more obviously into knives. Practicing tricks in front of me, showing videos to me, and starting a collection. She even asked for a knife for her birthday that year, showing me exactly which one she wanted. Before, she was into camping, into guns, which, ironically, I have zero issues with, and how to forage, make shelter, purify water, basic survival stuff, and artillery and tanks. She did multiple courses about military history in college, and busted out the textbook sometimes if she remembered something she thought I would find interesting. But suddenly, it seemed like her focus was on carving and skinning animals, on knife wounds and tricks, and collecting and displaying knives. She started doing the tricks more often in front of me, even when sitting next to me on the couch or at the dinner table. She would gesture with the knife without thinking, and even pointed at me again, one of my major triggers is knives pointed at people or animals. She started sending me videos of news clips of other break-ins, or news reports of robberies ending in murder, between a bunch of other funny videos or pictures. So checking Snapchat became a game of Russian roulette. If I didn't check the links sent through text, she'd keep sending them and ask what I thought. She'd forget she had the knife in hand when she came up to me, sometimes from behind. My nightmares came back. My anxiety got worse. No matter how often I reminded her to please stop playing with the knife in front of me, or at least not next to me, she would always forget after a little bit. Some part of me refuses to believe there's no way she risked bodily harm just to unnerve me. It came to a head when she pulled a prank where she pretended to cut off a finger. We had a huge fight, our biggest one yet. I wish I'd acted differently and not stormed out, but I did. There is a lot about my time with Nicole that I would have done differently in hindsight. I was so sure I'd just break up with her for good. I don't know why I didn't break up with her. When I did it first, I did it alone because my friend Jack rolled his eyes and called me a PSA for wanting backup. So, I did it in a coffee shop instead, hoping the public I could be my backup. Nicole stared at me with this affronted expression, as if I couldn't find the words anymore. Her eyes were huge and wide and hateful. Like, I've never seen anyone glare at me like that. She gripped the cup like she was going to throw it at me, I had it in my head to bolt the second she moved because I could see it so clearly. But then she started crying loudly and kept asking why I would do this to her, and that she hoped I found happiness with someone better since she clearly wasn't enough for me, despite doing everything to be a good girlfriend. I felt like shit, and people were staring, so I wished her well and asked if she wanted me to call a friend, but she told me to leave her the fuck alone so I did. I hate how I handled the breakup, 
but it felt like autopilot at the moment. In short, I lost the support of our mutual friends, who had become my only friends during my relationship with Nicole, which I understand as they have known her for much longer. Jack actually confronted me and called me a piece of shit for embarrassing her like that in public, calling me trash for leaving her sobbing alone and not even offering her a ride home, he wouldn't listen to my explanations and said I could excuse myself, but everyone now knew what kind of guy I really am. People at work mentioned how sad it was that we broke up. I didn't feel like it was the place to explain my reasoning, and after the confrontation with Jack I didn't feel like I had a right to. I felt like crap, like a shit person, and I felt numb. I tried to move on, to find a new normal. After about a month of us being broken up, she called me and begged for me to come over to help her, she was scared she'd hurt herself. I went to her immediately. I held her all night and helped her wash her hair after days of not being able to bring herself to it. She admitted she'd done a horrible thing and that she couldn't stand how she'd treated me, that she wished she could go back and change so we could still be together. Didn't know how to address that, so I just stayed with her the whole night and the next day at work, she came by to drop off a homemade lunch and to thank me for being there for her. I stupidly let myself get sucked back in. I get that it's my fault. Coffee in the morning became dinner and drinks out became movie nights. We went to shows and flea markets together because we still had similar interests. One time, she even noticed a booth with knives and directed us away, and while yes it wasn't necessary as I could see a knife display and not be freaked out, it was a nice gesture because before, she would have gone there and either bought one herself or asked me to buy it for her, one of multiple changes that made me think maybe she was truly making an effort. That, at the least, maybe we could be friends again. I started to get invited back into the group somewhat. Two months later, she kissed me. We were both drunk, and it didn't go any further. I didn't talk to her about it because I thought she didn't remember, but then she approached me to ask if there was any salvaging, us, if she'd proven that she was different now and things would be better. I thought maybe. I stayed because she really had been so sweet, it was like starting over, and we got back together. I was permitted back into the friend group in full, though Crystal had stopped talking to everyone and Jack still refused to talk to me, and while it was awkward at first, soon enough, we were acting like we'd never stop being friends for even a minute. It felt so good to go back to normal, it was like a weight off my chest, and I could breathe again. It was nice for a while. She was so careful about the knife thing, and it really did feel so normal and steady. Sure we had small fights, but we always made up shortly after, and she'd be overwhelmingly loving after the fact. It felt like it was before, so it felt normal. I can't pinpoint when it started to creep back, but maybe when she started watching documentaries on her phone with the sound up high while sitting next to me, or when she'd poke or grab me while I was cutting up dinner, then laugh at my startle response. Or she'd scoff if I teared up watching or reading something, then tell me later that it was out of fondness, not exasperation, and I really needed to stop reading so much into it. Or she'd yell at me for forgetting something that she never even told me about, and then the next day, she'd get frustrated that I didn't insist properly that she was mistaken. It was all small things that, on their own, weren't even that big of a deal, and I didn't feel like I could just speak up about it, or else I was nitpicking her. In hindsight, I was making excuses and clinging to when she was nice to me, trying to do anything to make sure we just stayed happy and without bumps. Part of it was that I knew now that I'd be alone, that no one would understand why I'd throw away a good relationship, and that being with her was the best thing that could ever happen to me. We moved in together four months after we got back together. She was hinting around that it was the only way to prove to her that I'd forgiven her, and that way, we could move on and be happy. She insisted I move into her place, because it was easier to move an apartment into a house than the other way around. It constantly felt like she was dangling that night, where she was suicidal over me, like one wrong move from me, and maybe the next time she wouldn't call for help. When we had fights, she paced through the house flicking a knife, looping from the bedroom to the living room to the office, or said every single argument was really due to the fact I was holding a grudge over the prank, and that we wouldn't be arguing if I just grew up and stopped taking out my trauma on her. She'd tell me not to piss her off because it would be too easy for her to make a mistake and no one would think twice about what happened. A few times, she'd gone on a rampage and overturned tables and threw glasses into the sink and dishwasher and said we were done for good, only for the next day to blow up my phone, begging me to talk this out or have her friends encourage me to swallow my pride and go back to her because she's miserable without me and she's trying so hard, or she'd just wake me with a kiss after making me sleep on the couch as if the night before never happened. If I asked about the night before, the fight would start all over, at this time it'd be my fault because she was trying to move on, but I was holding a grudge. The following nearly 10 months were the most terrifying, anxiety-riddled period of my life, and I only had myself to blame. 
Coming home from work, I puked my guts out more than a few times on the way just because I didn't want to go back to her. I felt trapped. She threw away the blanket my mother had knitted me for my crib because it was dirty. It wasn't dirty, it was a knit blanket that had been repaired repeatedly and hand washed frequently, so she'd accidentally put it through the wash and destroyed it, then bought a completely different throw blanket as a replacement and got mad when I didn't consider the matter resolved. She pulled another prank, this time with a fake positive pregnancy test, and berated me for not being overjoyed because I immediately started panicking about the cost, bringing up a child in our dysfunction, and handling the stress rather than being excited. I feel like she wanted me to be happy so that she could crush my joy, and so was angry that I didn't play to her expectations. That night, she threatened me with the knife, pointing it at me and saying she should just snip me right then since I didn't want to have kids with her, and then held me as I sobbed because I went into a panic. I didn't want her touching me but I didn't know what else to do but let her and apologize to her. Another time, she put the knife to her own throat during a fight and said I clearly wanted her to kill herself and didn't stop until I screamed at her, begging her to stop. Sometimes, when driving, she'd start speeding and swerving or closing her eyes while on the highway and saying my fear meant I didn't trust her. Nicole just kept getting worse by the day. I remember waking up one morning with a moment of clarity. I knew she'd eventually kill me, I was sleeping next to my murderer. It still wasn't enough to push me away. Escaping her orbit seemed like too much, more than I could handle. Everything I had in me was focused on just surviving day to day. I never knew if she'd break up with me on a whim or pick a fight or be constantly pushing me closer to a panic attack all night, or if she'd flip and be so sweet and caring. I felt like every day was Russian roulette hour to hour, every word I said or action I did or didn't do was a chance to start a raging fight. She tossed out my antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication one night, and then during the resulting argument, she made a big show of forgiving me for raising my voice, I shouldn't have done that, I have no excuse, and then helping me call in an emergency refill. For weeks after, because I said I wanted to break up during the argument, she would ask if I was going to try to run away every time something went wrong. Is the takeout order wrong? Did I spill a cup of water? Is the streaming service not working immediately? Oh don't get your panties in a twist and run off, and do I have to worry about you leaving me over this mistake too? Eventually that tapered off, but maybe once a month during a fight, she would tearfully go to our friends and ask them to mediate. Then, during the meetings, she said that I kept threatening to leave her again over nothing, and how scared she was of losing me when she didn't know what set me off. More than a few times, she showed me texts from them where her friends were saying how she deserved better and didn't need to put up with me, but she'd tell me, I don't listen to them because I love you anyway. She'd slap me and push me during arguments. I could never do anything right because even doing what she wanted without argument, or not looking her in the eye could be enough to send her off the rails. Sometimes as a joke, just in general, one of our friends would pull out a little pack of tissues and hand it over to me, in case I'd run out, or make a production of hiding the butter knife at dinner under the napkin. It was humiliating, but if I spoke up, suddenly I was oversensitive, an embarrassment, no fun, and I had to learn how to deal with adult friendships and jokes, and they'd ask her how she could stand it. As a result, I didn't spend much time with them either. Usually Nicole would just go out with them, and I'd stay home, which was the most relaxing I've ever felt during that time, except for when she started randomly coming home without any notice or timeline like saying she'd be home at 6 but then not coming back till midnight or early morning, or saying she'd be gone until 10 and coming early back at 2 or 3, or randomly calling the house phone to make sure I was home and getting angry, if she even thought I sounded breathless, accusing me of having left. She started hinting that marriage would be the logical next step, and I insulted her for not having proposed yet. Then she bought an engagement ring with my credit card and started showing off to all her friends how perfect my choice was. I didn't want to marry her. I felt bad for not wanting to marry her. I wanted us to be happy, and maybe giving her the wedding she wanted would help. I didn't want to marry her. In all those months, I never went to sleep feeling safe. I lay awake in bed, hyper aware of how close she was, and trying to go over in my head if I had behaved well enough to keep her happy, and what I could do to prevent another explosion. In hindsight, it's sickening how long I have let this go on. At the moment, it was just about all I could think of doing. I often woke up with nightmares which would in turn, piss her off and set her in a mood for the next day, but if I suggested sleeping separately, she would rage about how I was calling her a shitty girlfriend slash fiancé slash etc. I started to keep a notebook at work and just writing shit down things she'd done or said, incidents, and what I'd done to set her off. It helped me feel more sane and also more like a fucking moron, because I could read back on times she actually hurt me, and I still hadn't left. 
Every time I thought about leaving, I felt sick inside. I'd lose every social contact I had. I would have to find a new place to live. I'd have to bar her from my workplace, but they can't do anything without a restraining order, and that itself felt like a hurdle too. I dropped all my old friends in favor of her and felt like they'd refuse to even talk to me again. I was the idiot who led her back into my life and rekindled the relationship, despite overwhelming feedback. I was stupid enough to deserve every bit of what was happening and too dumb to deserve to escape after wasting my previous chances. I hated myself and had frequent fantasies of just ending it all. The worst part wasn't the anxiety and terror though. It was when she was sweet and caring. For example, she always went all out for my birthday anniversaries or Christmas, with thoughtful gifts, except for the year when she kicked me out for the evening after throwing some decorations at the wall because they stopped working, for which she blamed me because I put them up. She was sweet and gentle one day, or even for a week or two, only to slowly start ramping up the tension until she exploded yet again. She had an uncanny ability to blame me in ways that made me feel responsible for her emotions and for forcing her to react violently. When we drove out to visit my dad for Easter, things started to change. Dad was concerned about how quiet I'd become and that I hadn't come for Thanksgiving or Christmas or even called on NYU like I used to. That I looked tired, unhappy and thin. Nicole was on her best behavior the whole time, leaving her knives in the car and trying to get everyone to focus on the engagement ring, but Dad still saw something was wrong. For three weeks after, he kept trying to contact me, but she wouldn't let me talk without her in the room, and she checked my phone anytime she left me alone and checked the records online to see if I had deleted any calls. Eventually I managed to get a burner phone and hid it at work, which allowed me to talk to my dad freely. He flew over with my uncle and they helped me gather my stuff from her house. When Nicole started sobbing and begging me to stay, my uncle kept her from the kitchen knives and had his phone ready to call 911 if she tried to hurt herself for us. When Nicole started to insist I was taking her stuff too, even though I was only taking things that I brought with me or I bought for me, I just let it go. She got to keep a few sentimental items of mine, and the loss hurt still, but the most important ones I was able to take like I was able to get all my documentation and cards out of her house. I didn't even bother with the ring. It was just money, and she was already acting up. Uncle drove my car home while Dad had me fly with him. I'm ashamed to admit that the months directly following the breakup were almost worse than the time I spent with her because I was out of survival mode, and I couldn't force myself to function the way I used to. I felt like a parasite on my father, unable to get my shit together, falling apart over nothing, being so volatile it frightened me I'm in therapy again. Sometimes I feel better, like I can see a way forward, but then I feel like I'm back in the thick of it, and I'll never go back to normal and I'm permanently broken. Worse, every time I cry or get triggered or have a flashback, I can still hear her voice in my head calling me over-emotional and too sensitive, that I'd be fine by now if I just got over myself, that what I went through wasn't that bad. She sent mail to my dad's house for a while, threatening letters and pleas for me to see reason and stop overreacting, pictures of us that were sentimental, guilt trips. At first I couldn't get a restraining order right away against her because I moved something about the jurisdictions and courts but when she sent those letters, it helped at least make sure she couldn't continue to contact me. I found my old laptop a while ago, and it had the password prepopulated. It wouldn't leave my mind, especially when I read what people were saying. Right now I'm just rambling to get my head straight, to be honest, but my arms were full of people saying how the sex must be amazing, how stupid guys get when they want to stick their dick in something, that I don't have balls or a backbone clearly, and I just need to man up. Basically, everything I told myself reminded me of what I did to deserve to be stuck with her. I don't know if I can muster the courage to address any responses to them, but I really just want to tie up this loose end in my life so maybe I can stop rehashing it mentally and finally move on. I might also give my therapist the notebook I kept of Nicole's abuse, but I haven't wanted to even look for it. There's still a box of shit that I haven't opened up because it's all fucked with my head so much. What I wish I had known at the start of all this shit was that any amount of genuine discomfort isn't an acceptable price in a relationship, and you're allowed to stop giving them more chances even if they're trying and seem sorry. You're not obligated to help people change, even if you love them, even if they do slightly better, 